Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 11 of my reusable space program in, of course, Kerbal Space Program. Now, we have ourselves a situation on the surface of the moon. We have a stranded Keithane miner which is unable to uh, leave because it doesn't have any fuel. And, uh, you know, having tried to land a couple of times, I think I've decided that I want to go exploring for new territories. So I'm taking my little rover up the side of this steep canyon and perhaps looking for somewhere flatter and smoother where I can build my base without, you know, running into a hills accidentally. So it's only a couple of kilometers away. But uh, that seems to be a good place. Anyway, back on Earth, we have a few launches to attend to. We have a fuel tank for our space tug because we need our space tug to be able to move fuel from the moon back to Kerbin. So uh, we already have one attached. This is going to be the next one. This one includes the quantum struts this time because I forgot that previously. And sure enough, we get that up to the station and with a bit of help from the... Um, from the little, you know, automated space tug, we uh, just put these things together as carefully as we can. Uh, just gently bring them back so that they mate and become one. And from there we take this, and uh, well, the station's a little away there, but we're going to dock this back to the station. Of course, viewing once again from the interior of the magnificent B-9 aerospace cockpit. It, uh, you know... <laughs> It doesn't make flying it any easier, but it certainly makes it look a whole lot prettier. And yeah, of course, we're just going to dock this back onto the station as best we can. And uh, yeah, we're on to launch number 29, the docking array for the Artemis station. As we pointed out in the previous episode, we have a very much uh, problem with traffic jams at the, the moon orbit. We really want to dock as many things as possible to that station, and we have quite a lot of vehicles. So this thing basically has six docking ports. It also has a bunch of fuel tanks, and it has a spare part attached there, which we will use to fix our Keithane miner when we get to the moon. But we have to fly to the moon first, and that is a long way away. It is many, many hours. That's why I'm starting it now, before I initiate my descent to the moon in my heavy lifter. So yeah, we're docked on the station and uh, yeah, this is unfortunate. I started refueling everything and you notice that the the lifter is on top. So I start clicking around with it, turning on the magnet and then I start jettisoning this and oh yeah, for some reason the magnet comes off. Crap. So I hit F9, reloaded and found myself not docked to the Artemis station anymore. So instead of actually docking with the station, I decided, you know, I've got more than half a tank of fuel left. I should be able to perform this important extraction mission using the fuel I have on board. So a decision was made, forget about the docking uh, and just go down to the surface. Now, of course, as I said, the winch, the Kerbal attachment system, was on top of the vehicle. And the reason was we wanted it there in the launch configuration. But for actual pickup, we need to flip around and dock it onto the bottom, as we have just done. Now, from here, we have to descend to the surface of the moon and with great precision get as close as possible to my stranded mining unit on the surface. So you see me just basically making a few adjustments. I've popped up a bunch of windows for Mechanical Jeb because uh, I, I've tried and I cannot fly the, the very delicate extraction. I can certainly get down there, I can get on into the location, but hovering over the target while <laughs> working the winch and everything else, it just became too much for me. So. Uh, Yep, I admit it, I'm not doing this too well and I'm going to be using using Mechanical Jeb to basically hold my altitude while I uh, perform the necessary adjustments. Anyway, we're just going to fly in manually regardless and uh, we're just bringing ourselves over, killing our velocity. This thing can decelerate at about 1G, which, you know, even with half a tank of fuel, I was pretty confident that I was going to be able to pick this thing up and get back into lunar orbit. So you see there off to the left, that's where the, the DEMV, the rover, has gone. And 
down below in the valley, that's where my spacecraft are. So we're just going to come over this, and we're aiming for the correct one. We don't want to pick up the wrong one. That would be rather embarrassing, I think. As we get within a couple of kilometers, well, we're down below five kilometers now, so we're in the realm of no more time acceleration unless it's physics-based. But we're just going to try and bring ourselves over the Keithane Miner. And you see it there, just at a distance, delicately maneuvering, bringing ourselves as close as we can to this. Now, we're going to use the winch. The idea is that the, the winch will run to a certain length and uh, several meters, I mean tens of meters, hundreds of meters maybe even, maybe a hundred meters. It has a magnet on the end and we'll lower it down, attach it to the Keithane Miner and then reel things in and fly away. We've got the engines on the outside. Those are directed away from underneath me. So I should be able to loiter over the target without burning it to a crisp with those potent nuclear engines. Of course, we have the nuclear engines because they are able to sit and they have the highest efficiency. So they'll be able to sit there for the longest on this tank of fuel that we have. And, well, we do a bit more adjustments. There's a bit of quick saving and auto saving and whatever. And eventually, I get myself figured out. Now, watch that we're looking for the right thing here. You see me starting to punch numbers into the translatron. Translatron. And again, that will hold my vertical velocity and allow me to just kind of adjust my lateral manually. I still have to fly it manually left and right to get it over the target itself, but it just means I don't need to control my vertical until I... and Well, if I want to control my vertical, I can just punch numbers into the computer. Now, there is something I did make a mistake with. I forgot to fold in the solar arrays on the Keithane ray, and unfortunately, if you're at this altitude above the surface, you can't switch control because it'll tell you that you're not allowed to switch control while you're about to crash. Even though I would have had plenty of time. See, the danger is with the solar panels folded out, it's entirely possible that my uh, magnet will latch onto those instead. And as we've seen, they're not the most um, robust parts. So uh, there's a real danger that you grab onto some you know, minor part that isn't fully anchored. And then when you accelerate away, it will snap off and your entire thing will be just pulled over and destroyed. So I was very anxious about this. But nonetheless, you see, uh, it it still requires a lot of manual flying here. You see me just hovering on these engines. The, the thrust is about 20% thrust, not even that, less than that. So we're going to get a lot of use out of these. Uh, we're going to get a lot of lighter time on these four engines here. So just trying to bring it back over. We're now uh, 270 meters from the, the object. Because we're at such low altitude, we no longer have access to the chase cam. So actually figuring out what way is what is non-trivial. And it it turns into a, a, you get, well, you end up dancing around this target a lot as you try to neutralize your lateral velocity and make sure that you move in the correct direction. So there, I'm actually using the kill horizontal speed option on the translatron and also telling it to uh, lower my altitude again. We're down probably about, uh, we're about down below 100 meters and we just have to get over it. We want to get ourselves maybe uh, you know, 50 meters or so. The problem also is that if, you're, if you extend the cable and it's too long, it will swing around. And that can be, you know, that will waste you a lot of time if you let that swing. You want to kind of get yourself stabilized over the target, as close to the target as you can, before you start extending your magnet. And there you see me trying to work on this again, and it's really kind of hard. 42 meters above the surface, which means the top of that thing is probably 35 meters, 33 meters it says. So. We can maybe get a little lower than that, but we're definitely close enough to start working on the winch. So we're just telling it, or just trying to get ourselves over this target, and it is so frustrating. Of course, all this time, I am burning away my fuel, and I did come out here with less than a fuel tank, a full tank of fuel, because really, 
I figured, how hard could it be? Well, you know, the fuel is ticking down very slowly and I'm starting to perhaps think that maybe I should have been patient and gone back and docked. <laughs> that was not a good plan. So yeah, we're just dropping the altitude a little lower now, setting minus three meters, and so we're now, it now says 33 meters above the surface, 24 meters to the target. I'm now extending my, uh, extending the cable, and we're gonna turn on the magnet when it hits about 25 meters long. We just gotta stop it extending too far. We don't want it to touch the ground, so there. Uh, stopping at about 30 meters long, so that'll be a few meters above the ground. Turning on the magnet, and you can hear this sound effects if you listen very carefully. I'm hoping, I'm trying to get it to attach to something that isn't there. That sounds like it's attached. Nope. Just gonna try adjusting. I don't know what it's gonna... There, we got something. Okay. So now, it says storage apparatus. Now we shall lift ourselves up. I'm going to punch a number into the translatron. Like five meters per second, lift myself up. There, look, I have it. So now what I have to do is get myself into orbit using this fuel because once we're in orbit, we can do the docking and uh, hopefully we can refuel this ship. So we're just going to turn off this, turn off the translatron and manually fly. The only thing is in previous attempts, I found that the the it had a nasty habit of breaking. So I'm only running about two thirds thrust, which is fine. It's still giving me half a G acceleration, more than enough to leave the moon. I'm going to extend out that cable a bit because I'm really worried that about those jets, those rockets cooking my target, or perhaps blowing off the the solar panels. Those solar panels are very large, as I pointed out, because we need them to run the to run the conversion process yeah i think that's us what a great shot there huh this thing's just gonna flop around i've, I've extended it out to 50 meters i think that's as far as it'll go there and uh, meanwhile i'm trying to get myself up to orbital velocity so i'll probably switch over my instrumentation in a while uh, my velocity is now getting up to almost 200 meters per second vertical speed is 55 so we should probably start turning over a little now it's just it's very hard to uh, control this thing because the um the winch is in the middle and it's below the center of mass so that as i turn the winch will naturally want to pivot me around you know this is actually a legitimate pendulum effect but it's not the way you would imagine <laughs> You know, if you just let this thing go, uh, the pendulum would ultimately, it wouldn't rock back and forth. It, it would uh, tend to just keep me going the direction that I'm going. Uh, and ultimately, you, it would flip over. Anyway, look, we're getting up to orbital velocity now. We want to get our periaps up. That's really the most important thing. And you see we're kind of burning down our fuel uh, while our periaps is still deep inside the moon. We're just kind of going sideways now. We're just really concentrating on getting that velocity, that all-important orbital velocity. I hope we can get there without running out. If not, there is a contingency plan, <laughs> depending upon how much time I have. Time to apoaps is uh, over two minutes now, so plan B is starting to look more and more feasible. As we see the Keithane Miner just kind of flopping around behind it. Those guys are having a great ride, I'm sure. Not only are they getting wobbled around, you know, seasick style, but they're also getting a radiation, no doubt, from those engines. And that is my engines burned out. So now it says time to apoapse is 580 seconds. Now, that means we have approximately 10 minutes or so to unhook this thing and dock the two spacecraft together. Once the spacecraft are docked together, we can use the Keithane converter system to generate some more fuel and complete our journey into orbit. And that's what we're going to have to do. So we are on a ballistic trajectory, a suborbital trajectory. We are very much working against the time limit. And uh, there we go. We've unhooked this. Now we have to get it under control it is the one that's going to do the active docking because I, well, 
I actually decided to try and see if I could extend my periaps up enough using the RCS fuel on board this spacecraft and uh, it didn't work. So this is the only one with any fuel left. The f crew of the moon lifter, having rescued the Keithane miners, are now reliant on the Keithane people to actually rescue them. What a wonderful turnaround of events! Oh, the delicious irony of the situation. The rescuers now need rescuing by the rescuees. But anyway, yeah, we're just going to flip around here and we can uh, we can activate the the converters if we like. We don't need any of the mech jab stuff really. I guess we'll keep the orbital information up just for reference, but um you can see that I the Keithane rig is actually on a higher orbit because it's moving forward faster. It could probably get onto its own orbit safely. That would be a really evil thing to do, though. It would leave the faithful crew of the the moon lifter to their fate. Uh, I, I actually, the, the crew could probably EVA out and escape. So, you know, there's still contingency plans afoot it, everywhere you look. It would kind of ruin the 100% reusable thing. And that's really what I'm trying to save here. Is my, is my reputation as a, you know, as a mission planner, I don't know, a reputation as a player. Someone that can put together a reusable space program and not crash everyone into the surface of the moon without enough fuel. So, thankfully, this Keithane Miner is well balanced. Thankfully, we have a... You know, nothing that is rotating as we have controls here. We get ourselves in. And... Nope, not quite right. Haven't quite judged it. Of course, this is being viewed at double speed, I'm sure you'll you'll notice. Uh, just because docking can, of course, be a very, very slow and tedious process. I like to show these in accelerated time so you can get an idea of all the maneuvering that's going on. And there we go. Start activating liquid fuel conversion. Now, because uh, I, pop, I pop out the solar panels, but unfortunately we are on the dark side of the moon, so we're burning down all our electrical charge to generate what little fuel we can. But again, it's a nuclear rocket. It doesn't need a huge amount of fuel. We are bringing in the winch as well, retracting it so that we can not have it dangling around there. Point along the... Well, let's make sure we're pointing the right way, because... Um, there we go. Yes, periaps is now rising. We are burning the fuel that we have just converted. We have about 50 units of fuel, so that actually is pretty darn good. And we are safe. Oh, my goodness. I mean, you know, it was under pressure, but at no point did I feel that I was really uh, lacking time. But we have saved these guys, and now from this point onwards, we're going to, you know, get everything back, get everything running, and of course get our, our mining running again. But until then, I am Scott Manley. Fly safe.